Good morning or good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to Cisco Telepresence Video Communication Server Update. We're glad to have you with us. A few housekeeping notes to begin. As you entered the WebEx console, you either joined us by audio broadcast or by phone, which was automatically muted. Because of our large audience in attendance today, you will remain muted throughout the event. When you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the WebEx Q&A panel as you think of them. You can find the Q&A panel in the bottom right-hand corner of the console. Please leave the WebEx chat window for communication to our WebEx facilitators for any problems or issues you may be experiencing. This session is being recorded and you will receive an email containing a link to the recorded session. We would appreciate your input regarding today's webcast and a short survey will appear when you close your browser at the end of the event. At this time, I'll pass it over to Dan Gerson. Dan? Thank you, and welcome to the Cisco Support Community. Today, we present a live Cisco Support Community Expert Series event. During our event today, our topic will be Cisco Telepresence Video Communication Server Update. My name is Daniel Gerson, and I am the Content Manager for Cisco Live Virtual. Our expert joining me today is Arne Ostensen, a team lead in the Cisco Telepresence Solutions Group. Welcome, Arne. Now, I'd like to briefly outline the format for today's Expert Series event. We'll start with a short presentation on Cisco Video Communication Server Update for the first 25 minutes of the program, and then we will dive into the live question submission for the remainder of the event. During our live presentation, you may submit a question to be answered by Arne and a team of Cisco technical experts using the Q&A box on the right side of your console. The team of experts is well-versed in these technologies, so please begin posting your questions now to give us the best chance of answering them. If you experience any technical issues, please post those issues into the chat. We'll be asking polling questions during today's webcast, and we encourage you to participate by answering them. We invite you to, to, choose your, to close your email and other applications that may distract you during this virtual event. If you're looking for a copy of today's PDF of the presentation, you can download that using the link in the chat window. Now, let's get started with today's event. We'll kick things off with a polling question. How well do you know the video communication server? A, no, what's, what is this thing? B, I know it's some. C, yes, I have barely tried it. D, yes, I know it. E, yes, I'm a guru. Please go ahead and answer, those, answer the polling question now on the right side. And now I'm gonna pass the mic over to Arn to get started with today's presentation. Thank you for that, Dan. Yes, I'm uh, Arne Bergeton Östensen, and I'm the team lead of the EMA Telepresence Solutions Group. And it's an honor to give you an update on the Cisco Telepresence Video Communication Server. Today we are going, going to talk about VCS and its new features for the X7 release. The VCS is a standard-based Gatekeeper. It is industry leading in interoperability, including seamless interworking with Microsoft OCS 2007 and other voice over IP products. It's flexible with scalability to suit the expanding demands of customers. Business to business communications with standard based firewall commercial, which includes Ascent and H460. It also has a sophisticated web-based configuration and management. So as you see, the VCS X7 exemplifies the continued development and commitment of resources to VCS and its importance of in the overall solution and includes new features that enhance the VCS solution for new and existing customers. The VCS X7 software provides greater flexibility, efficiency, and resilience. For instance, shared call licenses within a Cisco VCS cluster. Enhanced interworking for home workers and B2B users. This includes, for instance, support for OCS link clients connecting to a Microsoft Edge server. Simpler scalability of deployments where the X7 software support Active Directory integration for Cisco Telepresence Movie. 
The VCS has a sophisticated call application management as ability to access external policy source, applying rules for call management, such as call party whitelist, least cost routing, etc. The X7 software does also contain improved operation support with advanced diagnostic tools available from the web user interface. So now partners are equipped to offer their customers an even more resilient solution with enhanced interoperability. Most importantly, partners may point to X7 as proof towards Cisco Telepresent Technology Group's continued commitment and reliance on VCS as a total solution. Let's start to look into the cluster call license management. With the new feature, Shared Cluster Licenses, you will gain more resilience and it will become a more flexible solution for all your call licenses. The call licenses can now be used for two weeks on another pair in a cluster if a pair goes down. This will normally be more than enough time to perform maintenance or wait for a replacement RMA. The call licenses can still not exceed more than 500 non-traversial and 100 traversial call licenses per pair in a cluster, as this is limited in the VCS hardware. So all the pairs in a cluster knows about the other pairs' call licenses. And if it fails, these call licenses will be available to other pairs in the cluster. The next new important feature I want to share with you is the AD LDAP device authentications. When you join the VCS to the domain and enable authentication via Active Directory service, you will gain secure authentications, increased user provisioning efficiency, and you won't need to use a H350 schema on your AD server. As you see in the picture, with this solution, the VCS will only challenge the password with MTLM towards the Actory directory server. In X6.1, the AD integration was only configurable in the command line interface. In X7, it's now in the web interface to make the deployment even easier. Move is the only SIP device for now that supports MTLM challenges. Other endpoints still need to use local database or another LDAP database for authentications. For the future, there will be more devices that will support this. If you want to deploy a secure video network, you will need to join both Control and Expressway to the domain to utilize the AD authentication for both external and internal devices. But you can, of course, only join the control if you'd like, and keep the expressway unauthenticated. This will leave external devices unauthenticated on the expressway. If you enable proxy registrations and disable the SIP domain, any external SIP device will then be authenticated on the control. So in this case, you won't have to join the expressway to the domain and active directory. Our next main feature in X7 is the back-to-back -back user agent, which optimizes and simplifies the OCS deployments. So my next question to you, what do you prefer to use? Cisco Movie or Microsoft Link? A, Link is much easier to deploy and manage, and I don't like Movie. B, I like Link. C, I think both are great. D, I like movie, or E, movie is the easiest to deploy and manage. I will always go with movie.
Back-to-back -back user agent is now the recommended configuration with OCS, but we still support the previous deployment as well. B2B UA will take the signaling separately from the VCS core and will give it more control. Media is always routed through the B2B UA and presence is now supported. We still recommend using FindMe in any mixed uh, video OCS environment to get the most out of the solution. When enabling the B2B UA, you will also get new functionality as call transfer, call hold, and multi-way support with advanced media gateway. Encrypted and unencrypted combinations are now also supported. One leg of the call could be encrypted, while the other leg can be uh, unencrypted. The B2B UA provides interworking between Microsoft Ice when using mock or link clients communicating through the Microsoft Edge server and media for communications with standard video endpoints. The VCS Expressway enables business-to-business -business calling from Cisco endpoints and link mock clients connected to Microsoft Edge server. B2B UA is compatible with both Link 2010 and OCS 2007 R2. Here you can see a deployment example of the total solution with VCS and OCS link integration. The internal mock clients will register on the Microsoft front-end pool, while internal video endpoints register on the VCS control. For the public users, mock clients will register on the Microsoft Edge server, while public video users will register on the VCS Expressway. Here we can see a company that is introducing the OCS link environment into the network to provide Microsoft mock or link clients on everybody's desk, in addition with video endpoints. This to provide video, messaging, and presence capabilities for all the staff. When they are integrating this with their existing video network, the integration will have the ability to, for video endpoints to make and receive calls from mock and link clients and for mock and link clients to see the presence of the video endpoints. This means that the company network becomes ready for the total video solution. As you see for the license consumption with B2B UA, you'll actually consume less licenses when using this compared to the old OCS relay deployments. Here's an overview of the call license consumption with encryption. And you might need to use the advanced media gateway to get, to get encryption. We want our customers to do, to do more troubleshooting in the web user interface on the VCS to make it easier to troubleshoot on your own and make it more simple to investigate. Therefore, we have added new enhanced diagnostic functionality in the X7 software. You can now st start and stop and download the log files directly from the web interface. New network tools as ping, traceroute, and DNS lookup is also implemented, which you only could execute from the root shell in previous versions. The warnings are in this version renamed to alarms, and all alarms is now shared over a cluster. You will also see timestamps for each alarm and on which pair they were raised. The IDs can also be filtered in the event log, and it also has a direct link on the alarm page. Snapshot is a powerful function for debugging. We are now enabled three levels of snapshot, whereas previously we only had the full snapshot functionality. As you probably already have noticed, the network is no longer available in the admin shell on the VCS. This is now implemented in the web interface. A great new and simple function is to set markers on the network traces. 
This will make it easier for an engineer to read the log files and identify the problem. We always recommend network traces to be set to the debug level. This is equal to the previous network2 command. If interworking is in the problem scenario, you should also raise the interworking log levels to debug. Same if you're troubleshooting the back-to-back -back user agent, then B2B UA log levels should be set to debug as well as the network log. Here you can see an example of a ping query, which also will list the response times. And here's a picture of the new trace route page. And finally, a screenshot of the DNS lookup tool, which now supports address records for both IP version 4 and 6, service location, and NAPTER record lookups. Next is system feature enhancements. You can now overrun the global call signaling routed mode configuration per neighbor zone to force call signaling over the zone. This is a very useful configuration, for instance, for call manager deployments where you want to route this call signaling in a specific path, for instance, to overcome problems with certificates when using TLS. If you are using a local database as your main authentication source, the VCS will now also do a lookup in the TMS agent database if it's not found in the local database. This way, it's way easier to enable authentication on the VCS when provisioning is enabled in addition with other authentications. So, for the last topic for today, the new feature implementations in X7. The VCS is now supporting publicly, globally routable user agent URIs, or GRUs. The GRU is a CPURI that can be used anywhere on the internet to route a request to a specific address or record instance. We have also added the packetization layer part MTU discovery function to dynamically discover the MTU size. The VCS will dynamically discover the MTU of a part by probing with progressively larger packs until it fails to determine the correct MTU size on the network. For now, the only way to enable this function is on the command line interface with the command on the slide. So to sum up the X7 software release, it will gain greater flexibility, efficiency, and resilience, enhanced interworking for home workers and business-to-business -business users, simpler scalability of deployments, sophisticated call application management, and improved operations support. So, the last question we have for you today, do you still think the video communication server is the best video gatekeeper there is? A, no, it's too expensive. I still prefer open source. B, no, I'll stick with my old gatekeeper. C, I might consider one. D, yes. E, of course, I will trade it for the world. Please provide your answers.
To read more about all the new features in X7, please take a look at the software release notes and the available deployment guides. So if you have any questions for me, please um, write them in your uh, chat box there, and I'll try to uh, answer the best I can. Great. Thanks, Arne. It's an excellent presentation, and, and thank you to everyone for participating in the event polling. Now it's time to answer some of the questions that you, our viewers, have submitted today. Uh, by the way, if you can't stay with us for the Q&A session, uh, be sure to click on the evaluation link, and that will be provided into the chat to let us know how you, this session met your business needs and expectations. We are very interested to know which topics you'd like to hear uh, in a future webcast. Now let's get started with the Q&A portion of the event. So our first question. When will VCS be available in VMware on UCS? Yeah, I, that's a really good question, and it's um, been requested actually by our customers. But this is also very useful when when uh, having a VCS in your lab uh, to to have less power consumption and also easier to manage. So we are trying to release this in the first half of 2012. Um, it will probably be uh, X7.2. I'm not sure about the exact uh, software will release then, but uh, it won't be included in the X7.1 then, I guess. Yeah, so okay. actually it's in uh, it's in February March time frame. Great, thank you for that insight. This is our second question. Is this on the approval list for JICT? Yes, our VCS servers were uh, JITIC cert uh, certified in um uh, for the expressway, the expressway is a public box, so it's it's critical for any business to have uh, have a JITIC certified uh, server, so we can make sure it's secure for for our customers. So uh, I can guarantee that uh, the expressway is JITIC certificate, and it's a very secure box for public use. Great, thank you. Let's go to our next question. In a cluster environment, if one VCS fails, will its, will its licensee be transferred to other active VCS nodes? Yes. If, the, if uh, you have a, a cluster of three pairs and uh, one of them goes down, uh, it really doesn't matter uh, uh, how many licenses it were, but it cannot exceed the total amount uh, that uh, it's limited in the hardware. So if you, for instance, have uh, two boxes with uh, 20 licenses each, and then uh, a third box with 40 licenses, and the box with 40 licenses go down, one of the other pairs will take all the licenses from this box, so it can still be used uh, within the cluster. And it will be uh, available for two weeks um, after the pair went down. Okay, next question. Does the VCS AD authentication support subdomains in AD? Uh, subdomains uh, in AD. Um, I think uh, I might need some more insight on that. Uh, let me see here. Um, I only tried with the uh, valid domains myself, so um, so I might need to answer that uh, a bit later today. All right, and Arvind will be answering questions uh, in the Cisco Support Community Forum, so you can always check back there for expanded uh, answers to these questions. Exactly. So we can move to the next question. Uh, what's the difference between VCS and conductor? 
the conductor is kind of a um, a secretary for MCUs to say it easy. It it will manage the MCUs. Um, if you have uh, two or more MCUs, uh, the conductor will then assign the the MCU with the which it, which is best fit for the conference you're trying to create. So um, if you have a pool of, for instance, 30 uh, MCUs um, and uh, you want to um, have more than uh, more participants than actually uh, what the MCU can uh, can have or the available ports on MCU, you can now also cascade between the uh, MCUs so it will feel like uh, it's, you're in the same conference even on your two on two different MCUs and the conductor will align this. Uh, uh, for the MCU side. So uh, as you probably, uh, the ones that ordered the conductor, you'll probably see that on the front panel, it's, it states it's a uh, uh, Cisco Telepresence video communication server, and that's just because it's the exact same hardware uh, which is used on the VCS. It's not a VCS. Okay, next question. Does audio calls from the CUCM to control or vice versa use non-traversal licenses? Uh, that depends uh, what you're calling. If the call needs to be interworked, uh, then you're going to use a traversal license. If it's a H two three to H two two three call, then you won't use a traversal license. But it's also depending on other factors. If there are any traversal zones, uh, if it's IP version 4 to IP version 6 uh, interworking, um, and those kind of factors. But normally you shouldn't use anything other than a non traversal call for this. Excellent. And I just want to remind everyone you can still submit questions at any time. We do have plenty of time to, to answer them and, and cover everyone's questions today. And while you're waiting, please do click the survey link and give us your feedback. And on to the next question. Is there any intention to release a Movi client for mobile platforms? That's a very good question. And uh, we heard it this since we actually released the uh, movie. Um, so um, we will have some kind of uh, early field trials in February for, uh, for uh, the uh, Apple uh, iOS uh, platform. So uh, iPad uh, will be the first um, uh, handheld device that will have uh, movie capabilities. But more information about that will be released after Christmas. Very good. Next question. Are the telepresence connections connected via dialing phone numbers with the phone or must a user use the presence application on the desktop? Um, I'm not sure if I understand that, but it, if this is a present question, uh, we have something called Find Me, uh, which will then generate presence for you. Uh, so if you have more than um, more than two devices in your Find Me account and one of these are busy, your Find Me address will be also busy. So VCS will generate an busy status on behalf of uh, um, that uh, endpoint that's in the call, which I connect to your Find Me. Okay, we have another question. What is the maximum number of VCS within a cluster? I'm trying to assess what would be the maximum number of endpoints I can support per cluster. Yes, good question. Uh, each VCS uh, supports 2,500 registrations, and you are able to have six VCSs in a full cluster, but only four of these will be active. So that means you can have 10,000 endpoint registrations per cluster. Okay, another question here. When H323 endpoint calls SIP endpoints, those are both registered with the same control, do they use a non-traversal license? Uh, no, they will use a traversal license because 
every time the VCS has to do something with the RTP stream, it will actually consume a traversal license. Uh, that means, uh, in this case, the RTP stream are different from HTTP to SIPs, so that means the VCS has to do something with its packets for the other endpoint to understand uh, the media. So uh, you will use a, um, a uh, traversal call license for, for this call. Okay, another question here. Uh, why isn't the X7 software on Cisco.com right now for download? Oh, very good question. Um, we do rigorous testing before and after call is released, and uh, we found a DNS issue, in fact, um, which we felt could be damaging to our very few customers, but uh, damage, damaging enough uh, that we did not want to have it, hence uh, the removal of X7. Uh, we quickly replaced this uh, with X7.0.1, which is uh, the exact same version than the, as uh, X7.0, but it uh, contains the fix we had. Um, we actually discovered this internally because we stress test our system at least two weeks internally before we before we go public with uh, any releases. And we had this software on hundreds of ECSs, but only affected three. Uh, so it's a very small chance if you're on X70. So if you're already on X70, because we had it available for a couple of weeks, uh, at least one week, I think. So some customers already upgraded. So if they upgraded, you should upgrade to X7.0.1. Uh, there. But if, if it's been working, uh, you should not be affected. But it's always good to have the latest version anyway. Great, we have another question here. What is the version of ASR code that has been tested and known to work with VCS X7? That's um, a question more for developers, I think. Maybe we can have it in the text there. So. Um... Okay, we'll have our team check that out and get back to you guys in the, in the uh, text chat. Yep. I have another question here on Movi. Uh, we would like to deploy our, our Movi to our entire user population of 10,000 plus users. How do I use the VCS if it only allows 2,500 registrations? Well, you can use a cluster, but you can also use multiple clusters. So you can always expand this um, as much as you like. Uh, we have customers with more than 10,000 uh, MIV users, uh, so um, so um, uh, this will work for more than 10,000 users. So it's scalable. Um, I'm not exact of the maximum number of uh, users we have tried with, but it's uh, it's scalable scalable if you have more than one cluster at least, as you can have 10,000 on each each cluster. Great. We have a couple of questions here around Cisco Jabber. Uh, looking to learn if uh, VCS will support Cisco Jabber in the future, or does Cisco Jabber uh, ever register to VCS? That's also a good question. Um, I know the WebEx guys are, are working on some uh, SIP stack fix uh, to actually make this happen. So, um, so the VCS team are ready to go, but we need to wait for the WebEx uh, team to, to get this functionality in there. And in the Jabber, of course. So hopefully we will we'll have a total solution with uh, with WebEx as well uh, in the future. Okay, another question here. Could it be possible in the future to to not need the domain in the username for Movi and AD? No. Um, that's actually our RFC on the SIP stack. So you always need a valid domain on on, on in the SIP URI. Uh, that's how SIP works. Um, of course, you can use IP, uh, but that's uh, in theory also a domain. So so um, you always need to have the domain um, and some kind of uh, user for this. Um, of course, you don't have to authenticate uh, any SIP uh, device. We have, of course, the MXP series and the C series, 
um, and also the CT, CTS, um, where you don't have to kind of, you just have to have a valid CPRI. So no username required, but you need the, uh, the at domain on all SIP-based uh, endpoints or clients. Great, we have another question here. And please uh, don't be shy. This is your chance to speak with an expert today. Please do submit your questions if you do have one. Another question here. Uh, I find trends in the industry to limit the number of call admission control elements, uh, for example, one for voice, one for video, in order to avoid creating and maintaining multiple network topologies. Is there a plan to have the VCS and CUCM to exchange CAC info? That's a very good question, and um, the R&D is actually working on this. Um, um, my personal opinion is that uh, we should separate this, but uh, there are various uh, opinions about this. So there's no final decision yet, but I think it's it's the best to actually um, split the video and the uh, audio or voice uh, deployments. Um, video use a lot more bandwidth. You should probably have other routes and those kind of things, other network capabilities uh, when using video compared to to audio, for instance. So uh, I don't think any other products will go away anytime soon at least. Okay, we have another question here on conductor. Uh, could conductor be registered with the CUCM? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think I heard of this, but uh, right now we we actually uh, the only supported way to do this uh, at at the moment is registered to the VCS. So maybe for the future, but not today. Okay, another question. What has improved in logging through the web interface? Uh, what we are approved now. Uh, can you please uh, repeat that? Yeah. Uh, what has improved uh, in the logging functionality through the web interface? What I really like about this new functionality is the markers, because um, uh, when when if you have done some troubleshooting on the VCS, it's always good to have a marker where you actually start the trace, because it could be thousands of lines before actually where you want to start uh, digging in the log. So the marker functionality is really great, and you don't, of course, have to use any uh, SSH or Telnet uh, client to log into the uh, VCS uh, to, to capture these logs, uh, and you can start and stop them directly on the web interface. So I think this is a great feature. Um, so for the future, you'll, you'll probably see more features in the web user interface instead of the root or the admin shell, um, because we want to do it as simple uh, as we can for the customers to, to give us the right information when they have a, a problem we, we will investigate. Okay, we have another question. This one is around upgrading. Uh, is it possible to upgrade to the VCS X7 code uh, when you're starting from X5.2? Uh, yes, uh, but any pre or earlier versions than X5.2, you need to upgrade to X5.2 before you upgrade to X7. Uh, uh, same with uh, X6, of course. But of course, we want all the customers to upgrade to the latest at all times because of security, new functionality, and of course, uh, it's uh, it's easier for for the tech engineers to debug if you have a problem uh, if you are on the latest version. So we can be sure that any outstanding bugs are are fixed. Great. Next question here. Uh, is it possible to set up your internal DNS to where you can install Movi with no advanced settings defined and have it find the VCS? Um, you can, of course, use um, use uh, IP on the internal and external um, VCS uh, in the configuration page. Um, but it's always recommended to have the correct uh, even if it's internal or, or public DNS, uh, it should always be correct. Uh, also, one feature I didn't mention for the X7 release is our new DNS uh, page, where you can actually force uh, domains to use specific DNS uh, servers.
Okay, we have a question here on SIP. How many SIP domains can X7 software have? In X7, you increase the amount of uh, the SIP domains. So now in this version, it um, it can contain uh, 200 SIP domains, which will do it easier for ISPs, customers, uh, which have uh, a lot of branches. Uh, in uh, in uh, early early versions, we actually only had five SIP, SIP domains. So uh, we now increased this to 200 SIP domains. Okay, I have a question on credentials. Uh, how many credentials for authentication can you have in the local database? Yeah, the local database actually now supports up to 10,000 credentials, um, which is great um, because you can have 10,000 regu 10, registrations in a cluster. So uh, it makes sense to also allow 10,000 um, credentials in the local database. So we now increase this to 10,000. Okay, here's another question. Why does my browser say that it's not supported in the VCS web UI? Yeah, actually I had the same problem when I upgraded my Mozilla Firefox browser because uh, lately Mozilla upgraded uh, their versions from 4 to 5 to 6 in a couple of weeks. Um, so this, uh, the new versions, version 5 or 6, isn't added to the VCS uh, database browser list check. Um, so, but if you are using a new version, um, then, um, then, uh, for instance, uh, Firefox 4 or any of the other versions, uh, for instance, Internet Explorer 10, when that release, maybe using it in alpha beta state or something like that, um, we uh, it sh it should work fine uh, as long as you have a newer and not an older version than what's listening when you get this arrow message up in the admin uh, login screen. Okay, good to know. Um, are there any software dependencies uh, on this release for the TMS? Yeah, we 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 had um, uh, well the last versions we had. You you always had to upgrade the TMS uh, compared to which version you had on the VCS, and we don't want to force um, force administrators to upgrade the. Uh, TMS if you upgrade VCS. So the dependencies are still TMS 12.6 if you're using provisioning or find me. But of course, the, the new version you're on, the less bugs uh, is in there, and of course, a lot of new great functionality. So uh, you should always upgrade if you have the chance. As far, uh, well, that's my opinion at least. Okay, another question. Uh, if you upgrade a VCS without authentication set from uh, X5.2 or earlier, what happens to the zones and subzones? Yes, you probably um, saw in in um, X6 that we we have a, a, not a global authentication um, method that we had the previous where the whole box were authenticated or not. Uh, we can now do, do this on the zone level. So if you're on this old version and upgrading to X6 or X7 um, that, uh, and you have uh, not enabled authentication, um, all the zones will then be set as treat as authenticated, which means it, it, uh, the VCS will trust it as an authenticated source. Um, so if you have any CPL for accessing ISDN gateways or any other cost, uh, costly gateways, uh, which can actually harm your business, um, all the users registered to that VCS will then be treated as authenticated and will be able to, to make the call. Okay, next question. Uh, from, from which versions can I upgrade to X7? Yeah, you need uh, to be on the um, X5.2 software to be able to upgrade. Uh, actually, we we changed the um, the core of the VCS from 32 to 64 bit in X5.2. So um, that's why you have to upgrade to X5.2 before you upgrade to any newer newer versions. Uh, when can we expect version X7.1? 
Yes, uh, that was also in the question for the VMware uh, version of uh, the VCS. I just got confirmed that in X7.1, we will release a version for uh, the VMware running on ESX servers. Um, and it's targeted to late uh, February, uh, early March 2012, or the first half of uh, 2012, actually. But we can expect it in the middle, uh, middle there, so March time frame, I guess. Great, next question. Could you have a different amount uh, or unbalanced call licenses on the peers in a VCS cluster? Yes. Um, you can now. Um, so um, you can have one uh, VCS with 10, one with 20, and one with 30, if you like. And if the one with 10 goes down, the 10 will then be transferred to the next, or the VCS with the least resources, I think. Okay, next question. What is the maximum B2B UA call limit? Uh, currently, uh, this is uh, limited to 50 calls. Um, so the 51st call will get the 503 service and available response. Um, this will um, most certainly be, um, be expanded for the future, but right now we have limited this to 50 concurrent calls. Okay, uh, it's a backup question, it's always important. What is the best practice for automating backups of a VCS? Uh, yeah, you can of course do this manually, or you can have a server extracting the xconfig from the uh, from the server at the time frame. Um, I prefer to do this manually to to be sure when after I configure the box, uh, I'll take a backup then. Um, uh, of course, uh, when everything is tested and all the zones, the credentials. Uh, uh, neighbor zones, social zones, all this is configured, then it's a great time to take a manual backup. And of course, that can be done on the web interface uh, as well. Okay, we have uh, one of our last questions here. Uh, when will an updated deployment guide be released for the Expressway Starter Pack? Yes, this is actually in progress. Um, we have a lot of new deployment guides coming out uh, very soon. So this is one of the deployment guides that will be released soon. Also, the the link uh, B2B UA deployment guide will, will also be released soon. So uh, for the ones waiting for that, um, uh, it will uh, be released shortly from us and will be available on, uh, on Cisco.com. Okay, I think that was uh, I think that was our last question. Yeah, uh, I will also be available for the next two weeks, I think, uh, in the Ask the Expert forum. So if you have any questions there, please let me just write it there, and um, I'll uh, I'll answer them the best I can there. Yes, please do. We do encourage everyone to go visit the Cisco Support Community forums. Arns will be there uh, as well as a number of other Cisco experts to uh, answer any questions or expand on any, any questions that you had answered today. Uh, again, please do uh, take a moment to fill out the survey listed in the chat window. Uh, the first five listeners who fill out the evaluation survey will receive a $20 gift card. Again, here are the links to, uh, to the support community forums. Again, you can download this entire presentation uh, earlier in the chat. If you just scroll up, you should be able to find the link for the PDF. Uh, we also want to invite you, invite you to join us uh, for our next uh, Support Community Expert Series webcast. Our topic will be Wide Area Application Server, and that will be on Tuesday, November 15th. Please do set your calendars. Again, you can always follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, all the links are listed here, and again, you can, this will all be in the PDF if you download it. We also have communities in other languages. For those of you around the globe, uh, please do have a look at these different forums. Uh, we are expanding all the time and adding new languages. Uh, Russian and Portuguese are, are currently in pilot, um, 
and the links to register are listed at the bottom. I'd like to thank Arne and our team of technical experts today for doing an excellent job on the presentation. And we definitely want to thank everyone for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.